All right, welcome to the Thursday edition of the Morning Pit here on youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. I'm Chris Peak from pantherlair.com. You see the website address below. You know the website already by now, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. We cover it all at pantherlair.com. And you know that because you watch these videos every day and you know what the site is and you know what we do. We cover pit sports, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Dot com. And of course, we have uh, plenty of video content here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com, sort of a supplement to what we do on the website at pantherlair.com, put out content every day on the website, lots of articles for you to read, and then we put out some videos too for you to watch or consume in any way that you are so inclined, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. So while you're here, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I put a little uh, handy subscribe button right down there. You can click on that. And you can uh, never miss any of our video content right here at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. I want to jump right into it. Don't want to waste a lot of time here today because we're coming up to the end of the calendar year, the end of 2022. And I thought we'd do a little year review, year in review stuff here on today's morning pit. Tomorrow, obviously, we're going to be focused on previewing the Sun Bowl and getting ready for Pitt, North Carolina, that basketball game at noon tomorrow at the Peterson Event Center. But so, you know, that, that'll be our last morning pit of the 2022 calendar year. But <clears throat> we can't really spend that day talking about year and review stuff. So we're going to do it today. But we got to get to the news first. Dior Johnson, news coming out of pit. University announced uh, yesterday afternoon that Dior Johnson uh, is returning to practice and is likely to redshirt this season. Dior Johnson, of course, the freshman guard on the basketball team, four-star prospect, uh, one of the top guards in the country in the recruiting class of 2022, and uh, has not been practicing with the team since he was arrested in early October on some felony domestic uh, assault charges or domestic abuse charges. However, they're 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 typically framed. Those charges eventually. Reduced down to a couple of misdemeanors, still, uh, you know, still of the domestic abuse and domestic assault variety, um, but pled down to, to misdemeanors, which he ultimately pled guilty to, received a year of probation and some various counseling and treatments, those kinds of things. But in the midst of it, he remained suspended from the Pitt basketball team. The policy for the university and the athletic department is that uh, felony charges mean immediate and indefinite suspension until the legal situation is resolved, at which point the university and the athletic department will decide how they want to proceed. Charges reduced down to misdemeanors and ultimately, you know, pled out and the door closed, you know, the, the book closed on the legal situation aside from, you know, one year of probation and, and some of the other things that Dior Johnson's going to have to fulfill and the university and athletic department and the Pitt basketball program had to make a decision on what they wanted to do with Dior Johnson, reinstate him, not reinstate him, kick the ball, kick the can down the road, and wait a little bit longer before they re, before they make a decision. And they announced, as I say yesterday, that he is going to come back to the team. He is going to practice, and he is likely to redshirt, which means not see the court this season. And there's probably a lot of reasons that go into that. I think a few people have said that it's uh, you know effectively a suspension without calling it a suspension, which I, I think you could look at it that way. I think he's missed a lot of practice time. You know, you're looking at being out of practice since the beginning of October. So you look at October, November, December, three full months of practice time missed. It's going to take a while to get back up to speed, to, to get yourself back on the court, you know, just in terms of what he's going to be able to do. You know, maybe it's best if he takes this entire year and, you know, practices with the team over the next two months, two and a half months, however long Pitt continues playing into March, but really tries to recenter himself and, and, and become part of the team again. You know, I guess it makes sense from that perspective. And, and I mean, you know, you, you sit back and, and do you want to, do you want to take the basketball side of this? You know, do you want to go down the bat, you know, look at things from exclusively a basketball perspective or exclusively the perspective of maybe what Pitt should be doing in this situation, not just basketball related, but in sort of the bigger picture. And, and I, and I'll say this and, and I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment myself on what Pitt should do in this situation um, in terms of how it should handle a situation where a, you know, a student athlete pled guilty to 
some, you know, it, it, it was it was a, a felony strangulation charge reduced to a misdemeanor strangulation charge and a guilty plea. And what should Pitt do in that situation? What should the Pitt basketball program do? What should the Pitt athletic department do? What should the University of Pittsburgh do? Should they reinstate him? Should they bring him back? I don't know if it's my place to, to, to pass an opinion on that. Um, I, I'm not sure it serves anything to, 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 to do so right here. Um, but I'll say that it's been very interesting to me to see the reaction, you know, at least on social media and message boards, and see the reaction from Pitt fans to this entire situation that it's not just sports above everything. Uh, there's been a decent amount of vocal pit fans. And again, I mean, we're talking about a minority of the entire pit fan base because we're talking about those pit fans who are actually on social media or message boards, which is not the entire pit fan base and probably not the majority of the pit fan base. But there's been a vocal portion of the fan base that says, we don't want this guy on the team. We don't want this guy on campus. That, you know, he he crossed lines by his own admission. Uh you know, that, that he shouldn't be able to come back from. And I think that's been interesting to see because more often than not, fans tend to err on the side of, I, I mean, just to put it bluntly, sports above everything. And so it's cur- it's it, it's been interesting to see that that hasn't been the default response or at least not the exclusive response. There's some who are saying absolutely bring him back. They should have brought him back five weeks ago. Pitt screwed this up by not returning, you know, getting him reinstated sooner. Um, and, and there are a lot that are saying, I don't care what he pled down to. I don't know what the charges became. Uh, he admitted certain things that shouldn't let him back around the program. And I think that's been interesting to see. Um, it's not entirely what I expected, I guess, is what I would say. As far as the basketball side of things, look, Dior Johnson's really talented. He's a really good player. He's a guy who was looked at as a potential lottery pick. Uh, a couple years ago as he was ascending through the high school ranks. And so you always want to add talented players to the roster. You always want to put talented players on the court because it should make you better. But it's interesting to me to look at this team, and, and it's something I've sort of wondered about for a little while, of how it would work when they do mesh him back in with the team. If he was you know, not on this sort of projected red shirt path, how it would work once they put him back in with the team. Because this team has some real chemistry right now with how they're playing. And, and to be quite honest, it, it's a chemistry that's been developed without John Hughley as well. It's a chemistry among Nellie Cummings and Greg Elliott and Jamarius Burton um, and Nike Sabandi and Blake Hinson and Federico Federico, as well as Jorge Diaz-Graham. It, it's been a, a, a chemistry developed among those seven players where they've learned really learned how to play together, how to play with each other, how to, to feed off of each other. They've created good energy. And sometimes you almost wonder if a situation like that, if you, if you can sort of upset the apple cart by adding in a new personality, you know, and, and I think you have to be very careful about how you work that back in. And so I was always kind of curious, you know, if Dior Johnson gets reinstated, if he starts playing again, how's it going to work as they try and mesh him back into what they've got going right now, which is a pretty good thing. And I think they're going to face similar questions as they try to mesh John Hughley back into this situation as his minutes have diminished and he's only played, you know, he hasn't even played in the last couple of games. You know, eventually as he works back up to speed and works back up to full minutes, full starters, starter minutes, which I still assume is the plan for John Hughley. I wonder how that chemistry is going to be affected. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Uh, with the Hughley situation, and I think it would have been a real question mark with Dior Johnson. You always want to put talented players out there. You always want to have better players on the court. Um, but sometimes it's not as simple as that. So I was, I was kind of curious of how that was going to go. Now we maybe won't find out. Um, and maybe that's for the better. I don't know. Again, he's a really talented player. And so getting him back on the court, you would think would be a good thing. But they've got some good things going right now. Now we'll see how it goes tomorrow when they play North Carolina. They might get smoked, and we'll say, "Boy, they need every every you know all hands on deck. They need all the help they can get." But for, as we sit here right now, fresh off the Syracuse win and you know a nine and four start to the season, two and zero oh start to the ACC schedule, I say, "Well, they look like they're playing pretty well." And maybe if it ain't broke, right? So 
that's the situation on the basketball front, the Dior Johnson situation. I wonder, you know, it, it very may, it very well may be that he fades into the woodwork and we don't hear about him or talk about him again through the rest of the season until, um, Either he leaves or he sticks around for next year and then becomes a prominent part of the team. Uh, but that's the latest on that situation, and maybe that part has sort of been put to bed, and now we move on with the team as it is. But let's look back at 2022, uh, since we are coming up to the end of the calendar year. Obviously, two more games to play, two big games tomorrow to be played before the end of the calendar year. But, you know, looking, and, and actually a game tonight, the Pitt women's basketball team has a game tonight, so we won't... You know, we won't be able to incorporate that in when we talk about, you know, the Pitt women's basketball team in the calendar year of 2022 going 9 and 20. And that's their games in January, February, March, as well as their games so far in November and December. You know, maybe that'll end up being 10 and 20 or 9 and 21. 2022, th- there were highlights for Pitt Athletics in 2000, 2022. But there was also. There, there, there were some strikes and there were some gutters. <laughs> there were some ups and some downs uh, as you look back over 2022. If you take Pitt's nine team sports, you know I, I, I don't, you know I'm not going to count wrestling as this. I, I think that's more of an individual sport. They they post a team record, but it's it seems to me more of you know based on individual success more than that that team record. You know, wrestling in the calendar year of 2022 was 10 and five overall, two and three in the ACC, but. There's so much that happens on the individual level that I kind of set that one aside. You look at the nine team sports, though. The two basketball teams, the two soccer teams, football, uh, baseball, softball, lacrosse, and volleyball. You look at those nine team sports combined in the calendar year of 2022. Combined record of 141, 119, and 8. Over 500. Right? ACC record... Not so hot. 56, 81, and 5. All those ties all came in soccer. There were, uh, I think, 8 ties overall uh, and then 5 ties in the ACC. And the reality is, I mean, you have you have the very top, the highest echelon, and that's the volleyball program. 31 and 4 this year, 17 and 1 in the ACC this season. ACC championship, second year in a row making the Final Four. I mean, just operating at the... the upper levels of the sport the highest levels of the sport for dan fisher right now and the highest levels of the pit athletic department i mean pit volleyball is is carrying the banner for this athletic department in terms of success i mean they are at the pinnacle football program uh, well we'll talk about football in a second but they had a chance to sort of be near that level as far as carrying uh the the flag if they could have built on last year's acc championship a little bit better we'll talk about that in a second but volleyball really is the top of the heap here Um, Dan Fisher has done an incredible job with that program. They are one of the top programs in the country and it sort of feels, I mean, that you saw how close they were to breaking through this year. Uh, you know, again, this is the second year in a row that they made the final four. I would say they have broken through and I would say, I guess I would amend my earlier statement to say that, you know, you saw how close they were to breaking through to the championship game this year. Just couldn't quite get it done against Louisville, but they reached the final four by beating Wisconsin in Madison. All right, you go to the NCAA tournament, you're in the Elite Eight, and you have to play Wisconsin in Madison. Good luck with that. But they won and advanced to the Final Four where they faced Louisville and ultimately lost. Lost what was the rubber match of a pretty exciting three-game season series. The two games in the regular season and then the NCAA tournament um, game between Pitt and Louisville. So you've got volleyball at the top. And then you've got the two soccer programs, which had outstanding seasons this year. Men's soccer went 12-5-5 five, and five overall, 3-2-3 three, and three in the ACC. You say, well, that doesn't sound all that great. But they advanced to the College Cup for the second time in three seasons. You know, ended up being among the top programs, the top teams in the country. And when you've made it there twice in the last three years, you're one of the top programs. And women's soccer hasn't had the recent success of the men's soccer. They're, they're not trying to build on the success like men's soccer. They're breaking through for the first time. Set program records this season in total wins and ACC wins, points, and goals. They went 14-5-3 and five and three overall. They went 5-3-2 and two 
in the ACC. They made the ACC tournament for the first time in program history and made the NCAA tournament for the first time in program history. So you have that, you know, the women's soccer team really kind of breaking through for the first time and saying, we might have something here that we're building. Whereas the men's soccer team is sort of continuing its success and continuing to establish itself as one of the top soccer programs in the ACC and in the country. And those were really the three best programs this year for Pitt. Volleyball and the two soccer programs. And I'll tell you what else was sort of a highlight, a bright spot. Uh, the lacrosse program. Emily Bossano taking over, leading that program in its first season of existence. And so you look at that record, you say, oh, they went 9-10 and 10 and 1-7 and seven in the ACC. Listen, the ACC is one of the premier lacrosse conferences in the country. And for a brand new program that just was born... <laughs> In the last year, I mean, it was born over the last few years that, you know, Emily Boston has been building that program to, to come into its first year this year in 2022 and to come out and win a game in the ACC regular season and then go to the ACC tournament and win a game there too. I, I mean, that's an accomplishment. You know, I, I don't think most, I, I don't think a lot of brand new teams would win a game in the ACC in their inaugural season. But the Pitt lacrosse team did. And so, you know, much credit there. You, you might look at it and say, this team went 1-7 in the ACC. Who cares? That's an accomplishment. That's a, that's a great start for that program. And it's exciting to see where they're going to go from here. They played a great venue, too, at Highmark Stadium. Um, I don't think that's what they intended for. I think they intended to ultimately have their own stadium on campus. But it looks like they're going to stay at Highmark. And if you have to settle for somewhere, you could do a lot worse than that place. That's a great place to watch any kind of sporting event. And uh, I think, you know, Pitt lacrosse is going to have a nice home there. Uh, So kudos to them on a great first season. So that's four programs. I I think out of the the nine team sports that you would say, all right, that was a pretty good year. I mean, some of these obviously were great years and you throw in lacrosse as sort of a, you know, nice job on your first go. You got four that you can probably feel pretty good about. And then there's the rest. And out of the other one, two, three, four, five programs, five team sports at Pitt, two finished with a winning record in the calendar year of 2022. Pitt football and Pitt baseball. Pitt baseball went 29 and 27 overall in 2022, 13 and 16 in the ACC. And they actually made it to the ACC tournament semifinals, which was, I think, a bit of a surprise. I don't know if I would say a surprise. I'd kind of forgotten how this season went until I went back and, and re-looked at some things. And, uh, you know, they, they were war- they were rolling. Uh, they, they just fell into a bit of a slump kind of, a, you know, late season that turned a lot of the momentum the other way. And they ended up, you know, kind of slumping into the ACC tournament, but they made it to the semifinals. And so that's, a, a, that's, that's good. You know, I, I think it's always going to be an uphill battle for Pitt baseball. Uh, and, and a lot of northern baseball teams. But that's pretty solid for Mike Bell and his group, for those guys to make it that far. Pitt football, the 8-4 and four season. Um, you know, We often talk about eight wins being the floor for this program or what should be the floor for this program. I mean, by that definition, they were at the floor this year. And they let at least two wins get away. It was ultimately given what the expectations were and rightfully what the, expe- what the expectations rightfully were. Uh, it was disappointing. It was a disappointing season to go eight and four when they should have gone ten and two. They should have competed for the. They should have won the coastal. I mean, quite frankly, I think that you know, particularly when you look at how North Carolina finished the season, Pitt should have won the coastal. They should have gone back to back and gone to the ACC championship game and and found out what they could do against Clemson. It's disappointing. It was a disappointing season, and you know, I, I think we've talked about that. <laughs> enough uh you know certainly over the last few months we've talked a lot about the disappointment of pit football in 2022 and then you get to softball 14 14 and 27 overall in 2022 2 and 20 in acc games women's basketball calendar year 2022 they went 9 and 20 with a game tonight um 2 and 16 in acc games and then of course the men's basketball team 15 and 17 in this calendar year eight and 13 in ACC games. And, and I mean, it's really, you know, I found this on the web. <laughs> it's really, you look at that 15 and 17 overall record. 
they're obviously nine and four right now. And so you can do the math on that six and 13 in January, February, March last year. And, and, and I hadn't forgotten this, but I was kind of refreshing my memory a little bit. You know, they up and down, I think they were three and five in the month of January. And then February, they hit a slump. Um, I, I think they lost their final game in January and lost their first three in, in February. So they were in like this four game losing streak. And then they got hot. They won at Florida State. They beat NC State at home. They won at North Carolina. They had some momentum. It looked like, okay, wait, they're figuring it out. They're getting it going a little bit. Coming home, got this Saturday game against Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech stinks. Going to get a decent crowd there. Got a little momentum going. They're going to, you know, they can really build something here. And then there was a big old fart sound at the Peterson Event Center that day. Laid a complete egg against Georgia Tech. Lost that game and... Really didn't do much the rest of the way. Real disappointment that was. Didn't lose. Didn't win another game. They lost out, including a 20-point loss to Boston College in the ACC tournament. Now, they're off to a much better start this season for reasons that we have talked about a lot on these morning pits and on the live streams and all those things. But boy, howdy, was that a bad end of the season last year. And so when you look at what 2022 has been for Pitt Sports, in terms of results, you got great stuff out of volleyball, really good stuff out of the two soccer programs, encouraging stuff out of the lacrosse team, disappointing results out of football and baseball, and just downright bad out of women's basketball, softball, and men's basketball. With the exception of, you know, I think women's basketball team is... So be seven and five so far this year. Men's basketball, obviously nine and four so far this season, I should say. And so maybe they have a chance to kind of build something better than what they did in the calendar year of 2022. But yeah, the overall records, the overall performance, it's, it's not good. You know, I mean, when I said that stat of 56, 81 and five for all pit team sports and ACC games during the calendar year of 2022, you know, that includes the volleyball team going 17-1. and one. And they still ended up at 56-81-5. 25 games, you know, 25 fewer wins than losses. Of course, I, I wonder if there's any moment in 2022, in 2022 pit sports, is there any moment you're going to remember more than where you were when you heard Jordan Addison was leaving pit? I still remember where I was. It was a Friday night. It was a Friday. It was it was I, I it was probably without looking at the calendar. I mean, I think May first was a Monday, and so it was it was the Friday before that. So it was probably like April twenty eighth or somewhere around there. Uh, maybe May first was a Tuesday or something. So it was April twenty seventh or, or whatever it was. But it was a Friday night, and I remember because I was sitting in the Pittsburgh airport. Waiting for a delayed flight to Newark. Taking the kids and the family to New York City for a weekend. Spring camp was over. A little bit of a lull. Get away for the weekend. Go to New York City. Take the kids around. Show them, show them around Manhattan. They were really excited. I was really excited. It was going to be a fun trip. It was a fun trip. Except for the fact that I spent the entire time looking at my phone. Trying to find out the latest on the Jordan Addison story. For all the moments this year. And whether it's the Miami football game or the Georgia Tech football game, or uh, the the volleyball team winning a, a, that game against Wisconsin, um, the uh, ACC tournament wins for the baseball team, uh, you know, even the, the the Florida State and 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 North Carolina and NC State winning streak in February for the men's basketball team, or the NC State win or Northwestern win or Syracuse win this year, you know, I, you know, this season I should say, I, like there's. There are a lot of notable moments from Pitt Sports over the last 12 months. But does any one stand out to you as much as Jordan Addison leaving for the transfer portal? I don't, like to me, that's the one. That's the one. Because it, it, it ripples out and affects so much. Those other things we're talking about, they're games. You know, and, and some are really big. Some are not as big. They're all, they all leave lasting impressions. Some leave a mark. Um, but their games, Jordan Addison leaving Pitt, I think obviously had, it, it reverberated throughout Pitt's season. You know, every game 
you find yourself thinking, boy, well, if they had Jordan Addison, what could they have done in the passing game here? How would how, how would Keaton Slovis have looked if he had Jordan Addison out there? How would this offense have looked if Jordan Addison was out there? But it even had reverberations beyond Pitt's 2022 season. Because I think that move was a message not just to Pitt and Pitt fans, but the entire country of exactly what was possible if that guy on the heels of a Blednikoff Award winning performance, if that guy could be enticed to go into the transfer portal with just one season left and bail just for one year before he goes to the NFL, if he could be enticed to go, anything was possible. Anybody could go at any time. Anybody could be poached. And and I think that, you know, that story got a lot of attention because I think around the country, people said, Wait, what? This guy is leaving that place? Really? That's college football now? And it is. That's college football now. And, you know, we're seeing it more this offseason. And we're seeing it a lot this offseason. And we're almost starting to become desensitized to it. But that was the one that was a shock to the system. I I think more more than anything you saw last year, You know, because even like Caleb Williams transferring from Oklahoma to USC, Lincoln Riley went there. I mean, okay. You know, like it's not, it's not a huge shocker. You know, when you see, when you saw guys trans, there, there weren't shocks the way Jordan Addison was a shock, the way he upset the system. Not, not that he was setting out to be some trailblazer or revolutionary or anything like that, but you know what I'm saying? That around the country, I think people said, Really? Really? And I think it opened a lot of eyes to the world that college football is right now. And and I don't say this in this disparaging, "Ah, I don't even know the game anymore. It's the wild, wild west. It's free agency, blah, blah, blah. No, no. It it is whatever it is. It is what it is. You know, and and I don't always like that saying, but it's just the reality. There's a reality of college football right now. And it was, you know, anyone who didn't understand or refused to believe or thought it was all going to pass, you all, everyone who, who tried to pretend like the game wasn't changing in that way got slapped in the face when Jordan Ad- and to, to wake up when Jordan Addison left Pitt for the transfer portal. And so that to me is the Pitt sports moment of 2022 because it meant a lot to more than just Pitt. And it meant a whole hell of a lot to Pitt. But it meant a whole lot throughout the sport. So that's my moment. Leave leave your your remarks on on Twitter or uh, in the comment section here. I'm curious what what pit sports moment stands out the most to you from 2022. That's the one for me. You know, I'm not sure there's anything that's really close for me. You know, there's there was some amazing things we saw this year. That win at uh, you know, I mean, just thinking football wise, that win at Miami. You know, the Virginia game opening with two pick sixes. Izzy Abanacanda bringing a Tony Dorsett record against Virginia Tech. I mean, they're, they're, you know, not to mention the Georgia Tech game, not to mention the Carolina game, not to mention the Louisville game. There, you know, every game is memorable. But that moment, that that's when I'm, you know, some of these games might fade from memory a little bit. I'm not, I'm not going to remember how they lost to Louisville, you know, a couple years from now. Probably. I might. Um, but I'm going to remember that Jordan Addison moment. Probably because there's a banner hanging with his name on it of all their Belenikoff Award winners. All right. That's the year in review. Let me know what I forgot. Let me know what I missed. Let me know what notable moments I did not mention because I'm sure there were some. It's 12 months. It's a lot of days to recap on a, a half hour podcast. But I appreciate everybody who watches the podcast as always. Appreciate, you know, we've been doing this thing since August. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. You know, those who watch it, I, I, I know, you know, I appreciate you enjoying it as well. Appreciate everybody who uh, follows along. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Coming up tomorrow, we'll have a full preview of the Sun Bowl. We'll talk Pitt Carolina heading into that game. It's a big Pitt sports day tomorrow, and you get it started with the morning pit. So hope you have a great Thursday. Hope you've had a great week so far. We'll end the week tomorrow with the morning pit right here on YouTube.com slash